I would like to welcome everyone to the Passive House Accelerator. Uh, this is the 101 series, uh, the show where we try to make it accessible for everyone to get into the Passive House train. Uh, my name is Jose, and I will be your host for the next hour. Today's presentation is 10 Steps to Building Your First Passive House, presented by Mariana Pickering. And just a little introduction uh, and a little bio for, uh, about Mariana. Uh, she is the co-founder of EMU Passive, as well as a recovering architect and an expert in communicating the construction industry's movement towards building science and sustainability. She has over a decade of work on high-performance projects and products across three continents. She's also passionate about translating data, results, and needs into stories that help shift the culture and mentality of building professionals towards change. Some of her experiences include working with Bill Becker on the 2016 Presidential Climate Action Plan, acting as a 2017 founding member of Passive House Rocky Mountains, and being elected as a 2018-2019 chair of the Denver chapter of the Colorado Renewable Energy Society. She currently manages EMU's passive, uh, EMU Passive Design Build Training Program, organizes the Colorado Passive House Happy Hour, and makes the wheels turn at EMU. Um, and I would like to encourage you all to ask questions, share your comments in the chat section, and we will have a Q&A at the end of the presentation. Uh, and now to share with us her knowledge in building a passive house, uh, I'll give you Mariana Pickering. Thank you, Jose. I'm going to go ahead and share my presentation. Y'all can let me know if you see that. We good? Great. So hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm Mariana, as Jose said, um, and I'm going to talk about, uh, it was really hard to get this down to 10 steps to be sure, but 10 steps to building your first passive house. Um, for a little bit of context, uh, I have out of the mouths of babes up here, but we have a ton of awesome alumni from our CPHT program who have helped me by offering some of their insight in what goes into coming out of the training and then jumping into the reality of building your first actual passive house. Um, I think one thing I want to really kind of mention about our alumni that contributed to this, but also just most of the passive house builders that I know in the world, I think there's um, a really nice balance of kind of confidence and humility in this community. So this is all about kind of sharing with each other making sure that we're all learning lessons from each other and being upfront about some of the mistakes that we've made over, over time and how to kind of avoid those in the future and help other people avoid those better. Um, before we start, and I added this slide in last minute, but this is something I talk about a lot in our training and it kind of gets glossed over a bit sometimes, but there are kind of two big life skills that I just want to point out. And I mean, this really should be for everyone, you know, all humans, but we're talking about builders today. We're talking about builders going down the passive house path. And I think one of the biggest takeaways that I've had over the years watching all of these projects take shape is that there seems to be a very strong correlation between builders and contractors who really work on kind of emotional intelligence skills and who have organizational thinking. And by that, I mean, you know, pretty much when it's a clean and organized construction site that bodes very well for their ability to master kind of the sequencing and the documentation that is needed for the passive house level of information. Um, and then emotional intelligence really feeds into this whole idea of design integration, communication between the whole team. Um, so, you know, if I had to pick two life skills for you to focus on <laughs> going down this path, these would be the two that I would, I would point out. So let's get started. Um, the first step is training, and not only because I'm a trainer, <laughs> this is key to really learning the language of Passive House and having everyone on your team um, on the same page. I had a great um, email in from Sarah at PJ Dick in, in Pennsylvania. She said, I can't, well, she said, I can't emphasize the importance of education enough for all stakeholders in a project, and perhaps more imp most importantly, for the trade partners installing the work. You can spend weeks designing a detail just so and selecting the perfect product, but it's all for naught if the last person to touch the work wasn't told what to do in a way that they understand. And she kind of went on in her email with me to kind of explain, you know, how important hands-on training was and, and all of that. And one thing I'd like to point out from the training perspective is that there is a little bit of 
uh, a myth about going into training as a builder, a contractor, you know, and, and an architect, frankly, if we've got designers on here listening, um, I frequently hear the line from architects, oh, I'm a visual learner. And I frequently hear from builders on oh, a hands-on learner. And um, I hate to bust your bubbles, but that's actually not true. We can have learning preferences, but that's not how we learn. If you look at kind of the research and the science between how uh, into how we can retain knowledge over time. Multiple formats is how we retain knowledge. So doing a class, listening to a video, joining these communities, doing some hands-on training, all of these things are reinforcing your learning over time. And that's what's really helping you go from kind of fluency to mastery. Um, so I definitely encourage you to look at education, certainly on an individual level, but also look at kind of doing some team building exercises with the key decision makers from your project so that can really kind of make sure that you're all again on that same page, speaking the language of passive house and ready to jump into it together. The second step I've got listed here is verifying roles and responsibilities. And I would add scopes to that as well. Um, Steven here gave me a, a, a great story about how his team is doing weekly meetings and how important he finds that to just kind of checking in and making sure that everybody's um, talking to each other each week about things. Who's the project lead? How are these scopes arranged to kind of avoid overlap between things? Have you considered contracts and liability for mistakes? Because mistakes will happen. You know, who's on who's on the hook for those things? Um, whose details take priority, the architects or the consultants, um, and how are specs kind of be in, being inherited between parties? Um, I've got some photos here from Greg Fisher's project up in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, he's been covered, uh, his project Millhouse has been covered a little bit. One of the things that's great about Greg's project is he kept the team super small. He was the architect, the owner, the builder, and then brought us in as the consultants, but had very few subs working with him. And so had a really good kind of grip on what those roles and responsibilities were, which allowed him at the early stage to really go back and forth between design and build quite easily. Now, obviously, as we get to bigger projects and and kind of larger uh, companies and other homeowners that are your clients and things like that, the complexities grow with that. So really having a good outline on who is covering what scope is going to be very helpful. Um, the third step I've got is defining goals, the client goals, and what the word success actually means to them. One of the things I say all the time is that 100% of the time, you will not achieve a goal that you cannot define. It's just the nature of it. If you don't know what the goal is, how can you possibly reach it? Um, one of the reasons we love Passive House is because it provides that set of metrics to actually go for. Um, but for a client, that could be a number of different things. Maybe it's certification, but maybe it's some other metric of the Passive House process. Um, and do you know what that is? Do you know what would make them view this thing as a success or not? What are the triggers that tell you and your team that this goal has actually been met? Um, Ryan from out in California at Abbott Reed wrote to me that goals need to be defined across the team. This will assist with overall project buy-in and success of the passive project. And that, that little phrase he said, the project buy-in is why we talk about this because until everyone on the team has that buy-in, it can be really hard to feel motivated to hit that goal. And talking about goals, setting those goals, that's a really important step toward that. The fourth one that I have here is vetting your trade partners well. And this is kind of an extension of what we've been talking about before, but very specific to hiring subs. Um, Tim from Apre Build wrote to me that his, his, uh, his company employs a team of builders to complete the most critical trades in-house. And this is a trend that I'm hearing more and more from builders that leave the training and start, start doing their first builds on their own, is those critical trades pulling that in-house. For him, it's excavation, foundations, framing, air sealing, mechanicals. He says, anytime architectural or structural plans are revised during construction, a project bottlenecks. But these delays are far less significant when, than the consequences later on from not correcting the issues. Typically, we wait until the building envelope is complete to bring in subs, as many decisions and changes need to be made between dirt and dry-in. And when we do hire subs, we have them sign work orders agreeing to install defined materials within defined tolerances. 
So again, defining exactly what is success for your trade partners, what is their scope, what are they going to be working on? Uh, the next slide is step five, verify true design integration. And I want to point out right here that um, if you'll notice, I'm like halfway through my steps and pretty much all of these are pre-construction and that's uh, that's intentional. I think the biggest mentality shift for builders coming from kind of the mainstream approach to construction into the path house world is really shifting a lot of the effort and energy to pre-construction planning. Um, and we talk about it a lot in Passive House, but anyone who is built a certified building, and y'all go ahead and talk about this in chat and back me up if I'm right or if I'm wrong, but anyone who's hit certification will tell you that you know the more time spent on these early steps of making sure everything's ready to go before you get on site, the better. Um, and keep in mind also that you know the strength of Passive House is its very narrow performance gap. So performance gap, for a little reminder, is the difference between how a building modeled to perform and how that building actually performed. And the thing that's amazing about Passive House is that because so much of the process is model heavy and simulation heavy, it makes it so that once that is built to the way that it's been modeled, there's a very narrow gap compared to a lot of other green certifications that kind of have larger larger differences between what they thought was going to happen and how it's actually performing. And that performance gap comes from the fact that we do all of this modeling and ideally in an ideal passive house certified scenario, we're bringing you as the builder in super, super early to discuss that. So um, is there coordination between the consultant and the architect, like true, true co coordination? Whose details are you using? Which specs are inherited? Are you getting large scale drawings so that you can actually follow that red line all the way through? Are you getting duct layouts ahead of time so that the framers and the structural all know what pipes are going through where, when? And, and are you verifying that there is actually one continuous red line, one air barrier, not two leaky buckets? In our training, we talk about them as leaky buckets. If you have one leaky bucket and you put another leaky bucket inside that leaky bucket, have you really solved any problems? No, you want one good bucket. <laughs> um, and the, the photos I have up here kind of to, I, I probably, I probably overuse this anal analogy, but I say this in all of our presentations. Like I think the, the strength that we have that we're not really taking advantage of as much as we should, but Passive House really encourages in the construction industry is virtual prototyping. And you look at the aerospace industry and now in 2023, they're not building a plane and then crashing the plane and then figuring out how to fix the plane and then building another plane. It's ridiculous. They're spending a lot of time modeling, virtually simulating how that plane is going to perform. And as I think I've got a good quote from Ryan on that, yeah, he said, why would we not implement this same practice in home construction? Passive homes demand coordination and a level of, of construction detailing that is lost in the current design industry. Let's get back to the basics of design, dig into the details and build a better building. And so what this is, is really all of our builders are just begging and pleading architects to bring them in earlier on this process, right? And just going back to kind of the idea of... Um, the balance of confidence and humility. One of the things we tell folks when they come into the classroom, check your egos at the door. There are a lot of egos in this industry, let's be honest. <laughs> um, one of the reasons I say I'm recovering architect is to kind of have some humility about that. You know, a lot of architects, to their credit, and this was certainly the case for me, we were not taught uh, buildability really in school. Um, and on the flip side, builders are not taught a lot about some of the uh, aesthetics necessarily. And so um, really kind of coming together to talk about those things a lot earlier is great. And then you add in this building science component of it and you know, the expectation that an architect or a builder are going to spend their weekends doing, you know, physics is absurd, really. <laughs> we need to kind of have a good grip on what our roles, responsibilities are, and then and then have actual integration between those um, between those scopes. Um, this is another great email that I got from Sarah, and um, it's a, a longer quote, but I want to read through it because she really kind of hits the nail on the head here. Um, 
She says, after going through the building sections provided by the designer and verifying that they are correct, I will chase the details to where it ends or transitions. One, to confirm I have the next detail. Two, to ensure to, I understand how the various lines will connect. Do these systems, do like systems align? Do I need to provide a transition detail or material between two different systems? Is this transition material shown or indicated in the drawings or specs? What is the compatible, appropriate, or warrantable, which is a whole other issue we can talk about, material for transition according to the manufacturers? Do the different manufacturers have opposing requirements? We almost, and here's, here's the crux of it, we almost never have issues in the middle of a system. It's always where A meets B, that a detail falls apart, and the devil is in those detail connections. I want these nuances determined early so we can capture the time cost to install them and make sure that our trade partners understand the expectations. Otherwise, and this may sound familiar to a lot of you, more often than not, the solution will be invented by a well-meaning installer with whatever they've got on hand, or it will be omitted completely. And that's kind of how, you know, things have worked in the construction industry for a long time. You're, you're expected to just figure that out on the fly. And that's why I was saying one of the biggest mentality shifts is shifts is going to these first five steps as a builder. Because, you know, when you're looking at something so incredibly high performance and so close to zero, it shouldn't be on the builder to find all the solutions to that. You shouldn't have to do that all yourself. But as the builder, and this is the reality of the situation in the industry, unfortunately, you do take the biggest liability. You do take the biggest hit. You do have the most influence over the entire process of how it's actually constructed. So you've got a lot of room for buy-in there to jump into that conversation early and relieve some of your potentially future headaches. <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, all right. Step six. So we're going to get into the nitty gritty here a little bit. Windows, 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 windows. <laughs> Anyone who knows me knows that we talk about windows a lot. Windows will, you know, from a performance perspective, make or break a project for certification very easily. Um, and I should say windows and doors. Simple thing, but the doors get forgotten sometimes. Sometimes that little sneaky garage door gets forgotten. Any opening on your building goes in this window door package. And that window door package needs to be super, super, super checked at multiple points throughout the whole entire process. Um, here's just kind of a short list, honestly, of some of the things we've seen over the years that are um, pretty typical and common. You know, sometimes you'll see that the architect and the consultant have different specs for the windows. Um, so which were the ones that actually went into the modeling? You need to you need to understand that and know who's taking whose details are taking priority on that. Sometimes the estimates that you get back from the supplier will be different specs than what was modeled and requested by the consultant. That happens very frequently. And to the window manufacturers and suppliers credit, there's a lot of specs that go into this and their typical client doesn't really know what they're doing about it. So a lot of times their sales force is kind of trained to, no, 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 I've got this. This is the package we normally do for high performance. But when you get into PHPP, you realize there's so much, so much detail that goes into that window specification that really you need to make sure that you're working with a window supplier who understands that you, you as the, the builder, your consultant, your team, your architect, you actually do know what specs you're asking for. These are the ones you want and the estimates need to reflect this. Um, another thing that happens is that maybe the PHPP goes through its own update process, but the specs don't get updated. And a lot of that's kind of inheritance of drawings and how that works. Um, solar heat gain coefficient pretty much is always wrong. Just... <laughs> check that like a million times at every step. Um, argon fill, you want to make sure that you double check and insist on argon fill. If you're doing divided lights, there's, you know, use non-metal muntins. There's some little tricks like that, that you just want to make sure to, to pay attention to. One big thing we see all the time is just labeling. Um, you know, the labels that the architect has on the schedule somehow get changed when it goes to the supplier and then they come back and they've got different labels. And sometimes you know, they're both numbers or they're both letters, but they're not the same ones. And it causes a lot of headache and confusion for the builder, especially when the designer, um, you know, and this, this is often the case with new designers to Passive House, for example, but 
you know, we always like to opt for simplicity. Like if it means that, you know, the, the building would perform a little bit better with these slight adjustments to the specs on all these windows on all these different walls, or it would perform a little bit less, but we'd have one specification on all those windows. We're going to go for the one because you hit all these other problems down the line. And so if it's not labeled, then you've got all these different specs going on on different sides of the building. You've got a really big problem or if the labels are off. Um, then you get to the delivery of the product and it could be wrong again. <laughs> so you got to check it again. So when that arrives on site, you want to check and make sure that you know what you're looking at. You can um, use the flame test for checking the low E coatings. And if people don't know about that, pop that in chat. We can talk about that in Q&A. Um, it could be that if you're using a, a sub or another installer or your own crew, maybe they installed it on the wrong side of the building. So like I said, if you've got a building where you, the consultant has spec to different things for different solar heat gain coefficients or whatever it is for different sides of the building, which happens frequently. And then your crew goes and puts one that's the right dimension into the wrong hole. It happens all the time. Um, and then finally, just the installation detail, which is a massive, massive world in and of itself. And that kind of goes back to the verification of actual true design integration. Um, sounds silly, but you know, windows typically have four sides and four corners and all of them have to be installed to the passive house specification, not just three of them, <laughs> you know, things like that. Um, making sure that you're kind of on the same page with your installer, which is why, you know, as Tim mentioned in one of the previous slides, having some of that in-house, if you're really wanting to go down the path of high performance, having that in-house and your crew is really super important. You have a little bit more control that way. Um, and then here's a quote from uh, Mark at Hammerwell. This is one of the builders out here in Colorado in the Marshall Fire area. He says, windows are so critical to the passive house certification. We can spend weeks working through details and specifications. It's crit critical that we include our designer, consultant, installer, and homeowner. Many decisions made around windows affect multiple aspects related to passive house conformance and design. As the contractor, we take the lead in facilitating these decisions up front because we will ultimately be responsible for the pass house performance as well as the look of each opening. In pass house, windows need to be selected much sooner in the design process than typically. We do our research to make sure that to be sure that potential window openings can work for the project considering all variables. We then ask that a window selection be made during schematic design or sooner so that we can work through the modeling and detailing during design, eliminating the need for redraw. So yeah, I'm going to say it again, windows, 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 <laughs> spend time with them, get comfy with them and check on them frequently. <laughs> All right. The seventh step that I've got listed here is check the mechanicals early. So you, you're, probably, you're probably seeing a theme to everything I'm saying, like everything, do everything early and often everything, <laughs> do everything about six months before you thought you were going to do it. Um, check the layout of the ducts ahead of time before the framers there, verify that the intake and exhaust spaces make sense and everything's balanced. Um, again, watch for the labeling thing. You know, ERV suppliers can also change the room names and such when they're doing um, their their end of stuff. And so you just want to make sure that the <laughs> that everything's lining up with what the working drawing set is. Um, and then remember that this is Passive house mechanical is different. So you want passive house specific commissioning of the ERV. They may charge you more is what we wrote because that's what happens. <laughs> we can talk about that in Q&A as well as far as costs. Um, and then allow some time for some post-occupancy adjustments. So a lot of times there's little things that need to be fixed here and there afterwards. And, um, and even if there's not, it's kind of good practice as a builder for customer service to do a post-occupancy check-in on all aspects of the passive house envelope with, with your homeowner or with your building owner, just to make sure everything is running okay. Um, Darius from Rabbit Run Builders in Maine, he sent me a funny email about uh, a lesson learned about an ERV that he installed in his mom's home that um, then the company went out of business and it broke and he had issues and all of this kind of stuff. And he says, the moral is you get what you pay for Hire a knowledgeable installer, get quality equipment. It may hurt the first time around, but if there has to be a second time around, it will hurt even worse. I was penny wise and pound foolish when it came to my first ERV, and it has cost me a lot of money and frustrating time to fix it. As we build tighter and more energy efficient, this is one of the most important decisions you'll have to make. 
Step eight is um, the blower door test. So uh, I think this was, you know, Mike talked about this in the, in the designer uh, 10 steps as well, but do it a lot and then do it more and do it early and do it frequently. <laughs> so a lot of mainstream builders in the United States are just kind of coming around to this blower door test thing as our codes are starting to require it around the country. Um, for anyone on here who doesn't know, it's this big red door. You pop it in one of the openings of the building, close everything up, pressurize, depressurize, and come up with the ACH 50. So the air exchanges per hour at 50 pascals of pressure. Um, it is different. The test, the standard that is used to run the test is different for passive house than it is for what code requires. There's actually like a 10 point test you have to do for a passive house. So you do want to make sure that the person or the company that you're using for the blower door test has experience with passive house, because otherwise they're going to see these super small numbers and not know what to do. <laughs> um, so yes, do it while you can still access the air barrier, even, you know, I think, you know, Kevin, I think said like at, at all the different layers, like at any time you need to make, um, anytime you're going to lose access to something and you want to see if that's going to affect the air ceiling, then that's a good time to do it. Um, some, some builders we have because of that have considered purchasing their own blower door test, um, to have to do at critical stages on all of their projects. I mean, really paying someone to come out to your site multiple times versus buying the equipment, it probably pays for itself pretty quickly. The thing to remember is that for your final blower door test for pass house certification, it does have to be a third party. So you will always have to have a third party come in and do it for those purposes. However, if you view it as um, almost one of your, you know, one of your tools in your toolbox, um, it can really be helped to kind of di helpful to diagnose things early. And then the other thing is just kind of, it's fun to kind of make a thing out of it, you know, make an event, invite everybody over, get some pizza and, and, you know, have the electrician and the plumber there so they can fix any penetration errors that happened and, um, and, and really be proud of it. You know, I, I, um, I have a, a picture here. That's not the quote, it's not the builder who's in the quote. The picture is, um, of the, uh, the same family that was in the earlier slide in Littleton, Colorado. Um, but I asked Peter from Sterling Builders, who was on the previous slide. Uh, this is Peter. And this is the Ogden Street um, duplex that's going on in, in uh, Denver, which is on the market, by the way, if people want to buy a pass house in Denver. Um, <laughs> but I asked Peter for some quotes and uh, this was the least aggressive. So I'm going with it. <laughs> He's a, a man of few words sometimes. <laughs> Stop giving out trophies for trying really hard and do a blur door test and earn it is what he said. And he kind of said that tongue in cheek, but it's for real. You 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 can get a lot of pride out of that moment. And it's a really big kind of uh, team moment. You know, you can you can have a moment where your entire group comes together and celebrates all of the work that you've put in up until that point. Um, it's really good as that tool to see that you're on track, but it's also really good just for team validation and, and feeling like you're hitting goals. You know, it's really hard to hit extremely difficult goals if you're not making milestones for yourself along the way and then actually celebrating them. So this is a really good way to do that. Um, all right. The step nine is to avoid magic fix all products. Um, we can talk about this a little bit more in, in Q and A when it comes to specific things. Um, and I don't want to, I don't want to say that, you know, there aren't products that do amazing things. I mean, one of the strengths of the construction industry is that our manufacturers have a ton of innovative, um, R and D going on right now. There's a lot of really cool products coming out onto the market right now, and we should, we should know more about them. What I worry about from a trainer perspective is that most of the building science education in the United States is really driven by those manufacturer claims. Um, and, you know, you just have to remember that, that they're selling products. And, um, and so you need to be wary about that. You need to educate yourself about that. You need to get some third-party information and then ask really good questions. Um, so having some healthy skepticism, doing your due diligence and maintaining that precautionary principle. I think those are all really important to um, really achieving success with Passive House. The key is that no product is going to fix the fact that you don't understand the strategy going into it. 
So you really, again, going back to spending more time at the beginning and more time on planning, you know, you really want to make sure that you understand the strategy so that when you do get to a little hiccup in the construction phase, which is going to happen the first time, right? And when you do get to that hiccup, you're not um, feeling strapped or tied to one product to fix this for you. Um, the picture on the right there is from Donneth Lake Estates, Black Timber Builders, which is this beautiful um, two-acre estates. I think there's 13 of them all going for low energy. Um, those are also on the market in Colorado. And you know, I think they've done a really good job of using one project at a time to really evaluate the products that are in their suite and not marrying themselves to any one thing and kind of adjusting for the next time around. Uh, I think there can be a tendency in our industry to kind of make a relationship with a supplier. And then that's what you use forever because it makes the most sense. And you want to balance, you know, trying out something super new that doesn't have maybe um, enough information about it. You obviously don't want to do that. But there's a lot we can learn about these new products that are coming out. There's a lot from that research side that we know about that should make it a little bit more comfortable to, quote unquote, go out on the limb and try new things as well. Um, Matt Brill from Bowen, um, which is another uh, builder out here, told me, don't just draw the red line, visualize the red line to make sure that the structure can be air sealed easily. If any aspects seem problematic, talk to the architect and engineer to determine how to adjust the architecture or engineering. The more time and effort put into the design with the architect and the engineer, the easier it will be to execute air sealing and insulation details during construction. So again, like the more time you have spent in that early phase of stuff, the less headache it's going to cause you when you do hit problems that require some kind of a fix in the process of construction. All right, last one. <laughs> now, I want it for the record. <laughs> I had something like give a crap or give a darn, something cute. <laughs> and the Passive House Accelerated people gave me license to misspell <clears throat> this, but I'm running with it. It's good. <laughs> So this is kind of the crux of the matter, um, care and craft. And, you know, something Zach talked about in a little intro video is just pride and craft goes a really long way towards, um, toward passive house, but it, it kind of comes hand in hand with this whole experience of, of wanting to get into high performance building. Um, you know, I, I would encourage people to remember that there's a first time for everything, but you cannot, you cannot unlearn things. And that's, what's great about this. <laughs> Once you see a thermal bridge, you'll see thermal bridges everywhere. <laughs> you can't unsee it. Um, and that's where, you know, that conversation really ties into the cost conversation a lot. You know, one of the very typical questions we get is, yeah, but how much does it cost to build passive house? Gosh, that really depends on so many things. But one of the big factors that it depends on is the builder's experience, because the first time is going to cost them a little bit more to try and figure out how to get these things done. But you learn exponentially every single time you do it, it gets a little bit easier. And, you know, it doesn't need to be as big of a lift as it may seem in your head. Um, a lot of the lift is in the early parts of that mentality shift and sequencing. When you get to the actual construction, you're following theoretically in a good team, you're following directions and instructions from a well-modeled project with good details. And you as a builder, you get to focus on your craft, taking pride in that craft, executing it really well and having a good, a good durable structure. Um, I've got, photo on here of Tully. Tully was our first pilot project way back in the day. He was one of our first students ever. Tully had zero construction history when he started with this. He was from the um, natural gas industry, I believe. I say zero. He had contractors in his family, so he'd been around some construction, so he felt comfortable jumping into it on his own, but he'd never built anything on his own. He wanted to build his family's home they went for a simple, simple, simple design to make, to cut down on complexities. And this was his first build. He got 0.14 ACH 50. So, you know, it can be done. You're good. I mean, some would call him OCD, but really he just cared a lot. <laughs> and I think it comes down to that. Um, and to end, I'm just going to end with this lovely little quote again from Mark. He says, 
Just as important to having a trained team is having a motivated team, including architect, owner, and key trades. Some of our more successful projects have been with team, a team that was willing to learn, take advice and direction. There's that confidence, humility thing, right? Um, having an openness to multiple sources of input. Giving a beep <laughs> is what drove Hammerwell to pass about in the first place. We knew that we delivered an aesthetically pleasing and code quality product before we adopted it as our go-to method of building. But we also knew that we were coming up short on comfort, durability, and efficiency. If you care about your craft, it's hard for me to understand why you wouldn't build passive, which I think is a great quote to end on um, because everybody that I know that kind of gets into this kind of says the same thing. Once they go through it, they go, you know, what? a lot of this is just really kind of common sense and, and, and really kind of comes back to me just doing a good job with what, you know, with my craft um, it is. And the, with the, with the, um, assumption that the first step to that is having a really good solid team. So if you've got a good architect and consultant behind you, you've got your whole team at the table early, ready to go. All that does is it enables you, it empowers you to be a better builder, whether you're hitting pass house level or not. Um, a lot of this should, should kind of sound similar. So if you're a builder that, you know, one of the things is people ask me what kinds of contractors, what kinds of builders like to do passive, how, you know, when a homeowner comes to me or a building owner comes and says, how do I find a builder that wants to do passive or that is good at passive? I say, you know, that's, that's really hard. Cause right now there's not, you know, there's only something like 700, or maybe a little bit more certified builders across the entire country. So you may not in your particular neighborhood have a certified builder exactly who you are. But instead of trying to go out and get somebody to travel in to do your project, my recommendation is always find someone who just cares about what they're doing. So if you're a builder or a contractor who cares about what you're doing, this structure, this framework and this guideline of Passive House where it's an actual metric that you're trying to hit with actual achievable goals where you can say, I got this on my ACH 50 and we hit certification levels on these things you know, that gives a whole level of pride that is really difficult to uh, kind of come back from. Um, and that's all I have for you today. So thank you. I might've talked too fast, but I think we have tons of time for Q&A, hopefully. <laughs> Yay. Good job, Mariana. Yeah. Thank you, Mariana. That, that was actually really good. And I mean, I, I did take some notes and I think, uh, I think your approach was great. Uh, I think you really broke it down. For for most of us, especially me, that I'm I'm getting into the part of figuring out how to build stuff for Passive House, so I really enjoyed it. Um, and I, I do have some notes that I wanted just to point out. Um, I, I think that the beginning, uh, you know, thinking about emotional intelligence and organizational thinking, yeah, for contractors and tradespeople, it's key. I mean, as someone that has worked with trades, uh, you know, it's it's that's one of the pieces that really. Uh, sometimes it's lacking. You know, if, yeah. if you can actually have those um, attributes to your practice, mm -hmm. that would come a long way, especially connecting with, you know, bigger firms and yeah. bigger companies. When I would add one of the things that I see in this kind of groundswell that's happening right now with Passive House, which I do feel like there's there's a bit of a groundswell happening. It feels like there's a lot more folks from the quote unquote, mainstream construction industry that are looking into this and trying to figure out how to go down this path. And I think it correlates a lot with um, another trend that I'm seeing in the construction industry, which is the trend of, of kind of business ownership, entrepreneurship, you know, understanding organizational thinking in that sense. How do I set up my team so that I'm not, you know, getting a lot of turnover and how do I reward them for their work and how do I keep good people on my crew? And there's a lot of, I think, uh, yeah. advancement that's happening with, with small builders, small and medium sized builders that are doing a lot better with kind of <clears throat> the business structure they're working with. And that translates perfectly into high performance because it's all about, you know, the sequences and organizational thinking. Yeah, no, I, I think that was great. Uh, and then just uh, just to give a little bit of time for the Q&A, I just wanted to say uh, your your comment on, well, the comment, uh, the quote that says, uh, you know, you get what you pay for. I think that's <laughs> another neat, you know, another piece of uh, piece of advice that is really applicable to not just construction, but everything, right? right. And, you know, having, having the right team, applying these 10 steps and then thinking about that line 
actually you know aligns you well and how you want to then move forward with the construction of the building so yeah yeah i i, I think it was great it, it, it's a good uh, it's a good kitchen recipe for us to follow <laughs> when working on passive house projects yeah i mean uh, house advice is basically life advice you guys <laughs> Yeah, it's common sense, right? It, it, it's common sense, really. Once you once you hear someone say, it, you're like, oh, yeah, that makes that's, that's what I should be doing. I should have yeah. been doing. Uh, so yeah, we, we have some time. We have 15 minutes. So um, I would like to pass it on to our sponsors and then going to Q&A. Hi, I'd like to give a big thank you to the fine organizations that make our work at Passive House Accelerator possible. First, a big shout out to our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Thank you, too, to our founding sponsors, 475 High Performance Building Supply, Baxt Ingui Architects, Glavel, Minotaur All-in-One HVAC and Dehumidification Units, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, Rockwell North America, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. And thank you to our champion sponsors, Icon Windows and Doors, Intelligent Membranes, Prosico, and Source 2050. And thank you to our patron sponsors, Aero Aggregates, Brennan Brennan, Brooklyn Solar Works, Euroline Windows, Coltraco Ultrasonics Micro Air Leak Detector, Inotech Windows and Doors, Lamalux, Owens Corning, RDH Building Science, Sanderson Sustainable Design, and US Engineered Wood T-Stud. Thank you, sponsors. Great. Thank you so much to our sponsors for making everything possible for us at the Accelerator. Um, my name is Kim Davis. I'm the Programs Manager for Passive House Accelerator, and I will be helping facilitate the Q&A today. So we still have a little bit more room. If you have any questions, feel free to pop them into chat. And it looks like we are starting off with Jay Stearns. If you are here, if you would come off mute and ask your question. Hi, yes. Um, I'm curious about the beginning of the project and getting the team on board and how if you're doing a stipulated sum contract, um, which a lot of the owners prefer to kind of make sure that Passive House is not going to be, you know, vastly more expensive. How do you recommend compensating bringing the contractors or the subs on board prior to that? So you're you're kind of you're asking that kind of from the homeowner perspective, right? Like how do you engage with builders that are willing to put that into contracts? Well, as an architect, um, you know, not you know, in terms of paying for bids, sometimes it's you know hourly right. or it's assumed it will be free. And if you're using the expertise of the builder, how would you recommend creating that team like atmosphere and yet adequately compensating them for what's uh is clearly extra time to be involved in a lot of these, you know, kind of interesting building questions. Yeah. Um, so once done, there, there are other people who can also speak to this probably on the line right now. Oh, I forgot Kim that we should mention. I've got one of our trainers here as well, who can help answer some questions and um, uh, Ben Lear, he's in chat with you guys as well. But so to answer that kind of, a roundabout way is basically you want that in in your bid language. So you you want it to be super clear when you're engaging builders to bid on a project that again it's about defining that goal. So if the goal is certification, you just come right out and say the goal is certification. If a builder is intimidated by hitting that goal, it's a little bit of a natural filter that's probably not going to be a good fit. Um in working with first time builders, obviously that can be uh, there's an assumed amount of like extra time is what you're talking about. This kind of um, learning curve is part of it. Also just the extra planning time at the front end. And I think that's kind of where the builders themselves in growing their business knowledge about how they structure their own payment plans and bids and things like that. Um, the builders really need to kind of think about that fact instead of, you know, depending on the timing of how they're billing people, um, are, are, is that compensation plan really kind of taking into account the fact that they're going to be spending a whole lot more time on pre-construction than they normally would. Um, and you'll see that the builders who have done this a bunch, they probably have structures that look a little bit more front loaded like that. Whereas the ones that are just coming to it for the first time might potentially underestimate the amount of planning time that's needed. Um, you know, one of the big headaches that 
needs to be addressed in those early state and part of having that first meeting to address project um, roles, responsibilities, and scopes is that you don't want to get into the situation where the owner or the homeowner is unwilling to, or the client, whoever the client is, is unwilling to kind of pay for the extra hours for all the members of the team to be at the table. Because what you end up with is there's maybe the architect is communicating with the consultant, but none of that is trickling back to the builder. And one of the people that that gave me some quotes for this um, presentation actually was talking about a very similar problem right now with a project where, you know, they're supposedly, they bid to do a passive, uh, to hit pass fast certification on a project. And they're concerned they're not going to be able to, because even though they've bid to hit pass fast certification, mm -hmm. neither the architect nor the consultant are bringing them in early to those conversations because they would have to pay for their time to be there at the table. So there's a lot of thought that needs to kind of go into like how the bid is structured and how that time is compensated. But think about all the time that's going to save <laughs> in right. the future and all of the mistakes that could potentially happen or the loss of the goal. I mean, more realistically, especially on these bigger projects, like you could just not hurt, hit certification, which if that's actually your goal, then you need to kind of be discussing those tough things like that compensation structure way in advance. I don't know if that helped or not, but that, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. No, thanks for the thoughts. That was helpful. Thank you so much. Um, next up, we have Jim joining us. Uh, earlier on, you were talking a lot about integration in the pre-construction phase. And you also mentioned uh, linking up with smaller builder businesses or new manufacturers. And so I was curious, um, do you find yourself engaging in design assist contracts with subs more often than a typical design bid build process? That's a great question. I'm going to, so Ben, are you on right now? Yep, I'm here. Do you have We're thoughts going. on that? <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on on how we can actually bid passive projects more effectively. Um, one of the great strategies is, is definitely having an integrated design approach. So having all the stakeholders at, in the beginning of the project, all at the same table. Um, there's been a lot of successful examples of that. Whether you're bringing in the trades in a really early stage um, really depends on the GC and how they're they're running their crews, right? Many times those uh, trade partners aren't even selected yet in the early parts of the bid project. So it really depends on your relationship with who you're working with. Um, but definitely having a more integrated design approach where you have the GC, you have the owners, developers, architects all on, all on the same conversation early on um, really gives a better chance to have a successful project. Can I ask you, Jim, in your design assist contract, what, it, what is usually, what do you usually include in that? Sure, so I'm designing, building, manufacturing, engineering, and installing high performance windows and doors and passive house windows and doors. Um, so I'm usually taking on more unique projects. Um, that, uh, you know, that might be like a kit of parts assembly or something where you're bringing multiple components in to create an entire facade. Um, so for me, that's really an opportunity to link up with the architect mm -hmm. and the builder at an earlier phase in the project as early as possible, hopefully. But are and you finding then, them reluctant to like engage in that design assist or... Is it no? I, I mean, I found it to be incredibly helpful because yeah. um, you know they're more aware of what is possible earlier yeah. on. Um, they can start to do things more like an architect might want to. Yeah. Um, design very creatively and more freely. I can work alongside them earlier, mm -hmm. um, and ultimately get better better projects and products out of it out of the process by engaging in, in, in that. Yeah. And do you, my, I guess my, my curiosity is given the previous question we talked about, do you feel that that compensation structure works for you? Because the design is this like structure format, the design integration, all of that. That's what we all want. Um, yeah. 
And it's about finding that contract structure that everyone's happy with that allows you to come in super early like that. And Ben, you've done a bunch of like window stuff before. I don't, I don't know, like the, I, I don't, I haven't talked to anyone else that does that kind of structure with the window installs, but it sounds like a fantastic idea. Am I right? <laughs> yeah, I love that. And I wish we would see more of that. I think I've, I've had some experience on the window side where in the design phase, the architects are starting to specify a certain type of window. So they reach out to manufacturers and start to ask, you know, what is their preferred install detail? Um, how does this go together in field? So having that level of expertise on the specific product at an early design phase is, is really useful. Yeah, I think it's a really good indicator to seize out there. If you've got subs and trade partners that have that structure, fantastic. Take advantage. It's assistance, right? You want them in earlier. That's great. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd love to be assisting earlier and find you know less reluctance to that. Um, yeah. And maybe find people who are uh, you know, also willing to compensate you for that time uh, because yeah. it, it does take a lot of time um, as, as you're yeah. indicating too. Yeah. And then you can get into a whole conversation, which I'll leave for now, but about the idea of valuing our time, valuing the worth of this, because you really want to, you know, make sure that they understand we're kind of shifting the construction industry, passive house professionals, we're kind of becoming like product designers. It performs to a certain level. What I'm going to build for you performs to a certain level. So are you going to pay for that performance or are you going to get the cheap product that'll just fix your problems, your immediate problems, right? And and you can't, you know, when you buy an iPhone, you don't like request that they take apart the iPhone and actually, could you put this other thing in? And actually, could you do this? You know, the, the clientele also is growing in awareness and education about the fact that they need to trust these professionals who know how to design and build and engineer these things. Um, and so thinking about it more like, like that, that you're, you're designing a product, you're assisting with the design of the product, you're installing and creating and manufacturing a product that performs to a certain level. And you deserve to be compensated for that, that level. Um, that being said, obviously you have to put that in the context of the whole entire thing and, you know, and how much does that person, that end user actually value that performance? Because, um, everybody puts value in different spots for some of them. It's, they want the clean air for some of them. They want the energy performance. So understanding where their value proposition is, is huge. Uh, and yeah, so that takes us to the, uh, the hour. Uh, we will be staying for around 15 more minutes to answer more questions or comments. So, you know, we invite everyone to stay in. Uh, or if not, you know, we wish you, you know, good afternoon, evening or morning, wherever you are. Thank you, Jose. Um, you actually had a question. I don't know if it's a comment or a question, but I'm curious if you'd like to ask uh, or I can read it for you. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, I had a question about the um, uh, that fire test. To figure out the coating on the oh, window, the or test. I think it's yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah. The flame um, test, yeah. Ben, you don't have one next to you, do you? <laughs> um, so if you get the the IGU and get um, a flame, you can do it with your cell phone light too. But you hold it up to the window, you can see in the reflections of the flame. Um, some of the flames that you see in those reflections will have this little green outline on them. And that's indicating mm -hmm. below E. And so you can see which of the faces of the panes actually have it on there, which is a handy thing. If there's been confusion, you're not sure if the suppliers got that spec down correctly. Once it arrives on site, you can actually just take a little lighter up to it and take a look at it and make sure that those are on the right, the right panes. <laughs> right. Oh, that's pretty clever, actually. <laughs> uh, and, and just w one more I guess a follow up on that one. Uh, so, and this it doesn't matter which level of Loe you have. Like it, you will see it anyway. Just serve. It doesn't matter believe, what the spec yeah, is, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not. Yeah, it's just to see that that it's on there. <laughs> nice. Ben, uh, yeah. Let's take it to the next the question. <laughs> Thanks, Mariana. Uh, next, we have Brian Bloom. Are you still on the call? I am. Um, you, you mentioned that the solar heat gain coefficient is almost always off, and I, I'm guessing it's off to the high side, but is it is it the higher low side that it's off by? 
I I think it kind of depends on the situation. Um, Ben, are you still with me? This is a Ben question. I'm just the boss. I just run things. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, the basic feedback that I hear is that because of the level of specification that has to happen, you know, so, as I said before, sometimes consultants, when they're doing the modeling, will have different solar heat gain coefficients specified for different windows on different sides of the building. And so um, depending on uh, climate and a whole bunch of other things, it could be that you are actually wanting to let more sunlight in than you uh, would in the typical market. And so the salesperson at the at the window supplier company um, either thinks it's a mistake or um, just sends out kind of their typical package for what it would be. And then you're not actually getting enough heat gains from the window because remember, you know, in, a, in passive house, your windows are not just windows. They're your solar collectors. They're your source of the comfort criteria and the hygiene criteria. You know, they're doing a lot of things. And so making sure that that specification for the SHDC that has been part of what was modeled in the overall context of the full whole building energy performance, it's really important that that's reflected in the window specification as well. So I meant, you know, it's going to vary a little bit based on climate zone. What I've always heard folks complaining about is, is that, you know, it's not allowing enough heat gains in because typically they're thinking that it needs to be a higher solar heat gain coefficient, but it may happen both ways. I'm I'm sorry. I don't have a better answer on that, but (laughs) I can find out more if you'd like. Okay, fine. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, next, we had a question from um, I think it was Peter Leonard. He was asking a question about the blower door. And I was just wondering, could you just kind of go into the general description of what exactly the blower door test is? Yeah, so it's to measure air leakage, basically. So we go talk about pass house all the time. Everything needs to be air sealed because the leakage of air is what directly correlates with with energy efficiency because the more air that is seeping out of your building it's taking the heat with it um it's not just taking the heat with it but it's also creating all of these opportunities for moisture damage as that hot air goes through your wall assembly it's going to hit certain materials and condense and potentially cause mold so air leakage is not just an energy efficiency issue although that's what we really talk about it a lot for, but it's also for durability of the structure to avoid moisture damage over time. So we really want an airtight building. And in passive house, that means, and it really should be in all high performance buildings, but it really comes down to having one continuous air barrier. So I think I mentioned in my presentation, the concept of the two leaky buckets. Like a lot of times you see people talking about, oh, this is my secondary air barrier stop red flag that that shouldn't be a thing. There there shouldn't be a secondary air barrier. There should be one air barrier that has been modeled (laughs) to perform well for that wall assembly, for that building to achieve whatever energy performance your consultant wants it to achieve, whatever metrics you're trying to hit, whether that's certification or something else, but there's one air barrier. And that's why we have what we call the pencil rule test or the red line test, where if you take a section of your building and you put your pencil down, you should not be, you should be able to trace all the way around your building through every section, every junction, every window, everything, and trace a red line around that continuous air barrier. So that one air barrier becomes super important for separating what is the conditions, the the air barrier and the thermal envelope. Thermal envelope will consist of the continuous insulation and the air barrier, but it's separating your conditioned interior air from the outdoors. And one of the things Enrico, my co-founder, who's our lead trainer, always likes to say is like, the goal here is to make it suck less inside than it does outside, right? Like (laughs) one of the things they joke about too is that, you know, I used to think I was an environmentalist and then I realized that the planet does not need any more buildings. We need these buildings. So we need to be healthy and comfortable and safe and it needs to be durable. And air tightness comes into that. So air tightness, the one air barrier is super, super important. The way to test that is the blower door test. And what happens is that big red door thing gets put into one of the openings, usually front door, but whatever. Um, All of the other windows and doors and openings are all shut 
and the envelope is representative of what it would be in the future. Sometimes, and again, if you're doing this at preliminary steps, you know, it could be that you don't have hardware in the window yet and you mask it off just to kind of get an idea. But by the time you get down to the final blower door test, the house or the building is as it should be. The only opening you're removing is where you're putting that red door. It's got a fan in it that um, the technician who's running the test will pressurize, depressurize. They'll go through a series of points um, averaging out at 50 pascals of pressure to see what, what you know, there's, there's a whole standard that they follow for how to achieve, how to get to the final number. Um, but it's a lot more detailed than what happens in a normal code um, blower door test, where I think it's only, I think it's a three-point test in code, but I'm, I'm not positive on that. Um, anyways. You get to that level, that number that you want in passive house, that needs to be below 0 0.6 um, in the international passive house standard. The, um, just for frame of reference and magnitude of things, code, uh, the most recent building code in the United States requires for residential three ACH 50. So three zero, 3.0, we're talking 0.6. So it's a big reduction. Um, but as we tell our students, it's like if one piece of tape didn't do it, 10 pieces of tape isn't going to do it. It really comes down to just what that strategy is for maintaining that red line. And that's why everyone on your team needs to know where that red line is. Every time you jump in to poking holes in anything, you know, you want to know where that red line is. Some people put big signs on their construction sites. Don't cut my air barrier. Some people assign, some GCs assign one person on site to be like the air barrier master who will come and yell at you if you touch the air barrier because you want it to be continuous all the way around. So that blower door test will give you that number. Um, you know, a preliminary test, uh, typically we require, you know, there's got to be at least one preliminary test. And then the final one is what goes towards certification. At that preliminary one, um, we often see that it's uh, a little bit higher than what they end up with at the final if there's certain things that haven't been addressed yet, but it gives that opportunity to go around and check those penetrations and check those leaks before the air barrier is covered up and you can't do anything to it. I talked a lot. That was a big, long explanation of blower door testing. That was really, really <laughs> helpful. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Next up, we have Noah. He said, how can we as architectural designers help builders to better understand our intent with goals such as carbon sequestration? Can you repeat that? How can we as builders help architects understand our goals? Mm -hmm. um, such as carbon sequestration. Well, carbon sequestration is really kind of like just coming into the whole path. You know, it's a passive house adjacent concern, right? Like, a lot of the passive house uh, standard has been focused on the energy efficiency and or air quality and has not really looked at carbon sequestration that much. Um, and there's a lot of overlap in our community with people also interested in carbon, also interested in natural building materials, things like that. Um, but I think really what the question is asking is more, how do we communicate that these things are important to you as a builder? And that's a great question. Um, and I encourage you all, I have a, a one hour long presentation called Passive Pitch that kind of where I go into like, how you talk about value proposition and how you communicate things. And basically it all kind of comes back to the, that first slide I had about emotional intelligence and um, communication. And I think, you know, it, in general, it's an industry where we have not been great communicators on that front for a long time um, with the expectation that I'm going to fix it. I'll fix it. I'll find a solution. I'll fix it. Um, and so a lot of it is shifting towards the front end of things, being able to clearly communicate what your goal is, why it's important to you and what that value holds for you. Um, and I think that when other people see you communicating well, your values and your mission, it helps them do the same thing. So, you know, for our company, for example, we're like super mission led. Our mission is that we want to see passive house standards be the way that people build in the future. Like that's the vision of what we're trying to do. And everything around our company comes back to trying to make an impact on that. It provides like this anchor point that helps you then have a reason, an excuse or whatever for whatever decisions you're making. So going through the exercise of distilling your 
vision and figuring out how to communicate what that is in a, in one short sentence, which is not an easy thing to do. You know, you start out with this big, long 50 sentence paragraph, and then you got to get that down to like, how do I clearly communicate this into one thing? What is the thing that matters to me? So if it's carbon sequestration, this is the thing that matters to me. And here's why. And when you start to communicate that better, and that's through your website, on your business card, maybe, or, you know, in your first meeting, when you're doing onboarding, when you're, you know, um, on your truck, wherever, <laughs> you know, in your, in your tagline of your logo and your, in the way you present your brand in everything, it makes it so that that's out there front and center. This is what I care about. And the people who aren't in line with that, they're just not going to be interested in you. They're just going to go the other way. And then you don't even have to worry about having that conversation anymore. <laughs> You're just drawing that line in the sand early and saying, this is what I want to do. And this is what I care about. And this is what I can offer. And this is the value to me. And you, it ends up that you get clients that align with that. It's a little scary at first because you think oh, you've got to take all the jobs that you can get. But it's amazing how it just lines up after time. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, okay. We have one last question. It looks like um, Sarah is gone, but Sarah um, Fire was asking, um, are building inspectors reaching out to get trained as verifiers? So no, <laughs> I would like more. Uh, okay. I think, I think in six years, maybe we've had one or two. Um, it's a big thing. <laughs> And, you know, I've, I've, I've tried also, you know, we have an online class and we've tried kind of packaging that specifically for permitting offices, like go take this kind of a thing. It's bit, it's difficult. Um, if anyone's got ideas on that, let me know, but <laughs> yeah, it, it's uh, cause then you enter into the whole concept of like inspecting, enforcing, you know, and honestly, this is kind of a conversation that's just really starting with the past West community because for so many years, this is a voluntary standard that people who are passionate about it have been pushing themselves. So they know they're going to, you know, do okay with inspectors and enforcers because they can explain it. They'll spend the time to explain it. You know, we've done white papers in the past to like explain unvented roofs to, to a, an inspector that doesn't know what that is and, and things like that. But going forward as more mainstream adopts this, as builders are coming into the past house world because their client wants it, or because an architect is asking for it. Um, that's a really big piece of the puzzle that we need to solve as a community for sure. <laughs> Great. Um, something to aspire to. Okay. It looks like one more question. Um, Brent Porter, do you have a question? Okay. I want to bring up the subject of, of construction management education. Uh, in my 47 years at Pratt Institute School of Architecture, one of the most significant things we did in construction was our construction management classes H had no kinds of energy work at all. And one of my jobs was have them to bring in a job that they were working on at the time and to go through a whole energy analysis, much less sophisticated as you all are doing now, and find ways that then they can recommend to their bosses of how small things, anything from window flashing to whatever it might be, could be considered. And then, and, and then that was part of their learning. And it was amazing, not only preparing them for the future, but also how their bosses are reacting. In behind me also is what I started 47 years, or maybe a little less, when Princeton built its first, there was a famous architect there that built what was called the first passive solar house. And as Princeton began their educational aspects, I started immediately at, in the School of Architecture. And one of our early models here on this side of me is to get students and, and construction students to take a model of a design, take it out in the sunlight, guided by an accurate, accurate sundial for the site, get the little gnome under the sundial to cast its shadow to a particular hour, like December 21, and tilt your model at the same time. And you could see how sunlight was coming into the building, how it was reflecting away, how the, the shadowing also was occurring. If you had a bigger model, you could see what you were constructing would be affecting the neighbors. So I really think that the, the construction management education aspect is another big topic. That would should really be pursued by the passive solar group. Yeah, that's it's, great. And basically what you just described there was like the low-tech design pH, right? So like the design pH plugin 
is a great kind of simplified preliminary tool that you can use with a SketchUp or Revit or whatever that can kind of, you're, you're really just looking at kind of volume orientation openings and how does the sun affect that? How does shading affect that? But in a virtual way, you don't have to build the model right now. You can, can do this all virtually. You get the virtual model and you see how it all affects it and all that good stuff. But you're right. It needs to be some of that early phase. You know, the earlier you do that, the bigger impact those decisions that you're making can have. You know, we've seen window packages that have gone down by $50,000 for a relatively small house simply because they thought they needed triple pane, but they were in climate zone four and they actually didn't really need triple pane, you know, and trying to look at those things early on before you put those, those estimates and bids out there can actually reduce a lot of that expense a lot quicker. Um, and construction management curriculum definitely should involve some of that. I think it, it comes back to that, like defining roles, responsibilities, and scopes. So in construction management schools, understanding who is on point for doing that modeling and who is on point for the design decisions related to that. And then how do we kind of assign those things going forward? But yeah, very good point, Brent. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Brent, for sharing. Um, all right. We are just about at the end here. I'm going to throw it back to Jose and he's going to close things out for us. Thanks everyone for joining. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kim. Uh, yeah. Thank you everyone for staying. Uh, we are really appreciative of all your comments and questions, and this is exactly why we want to have this 101 series. Uh, I personally always enjoy listening to other, people quest other people's questions and comments because they uh, they make me think a lot more about my practice. So I want to thank Mariana for the great insight and being so wonderful at sharing her experience. Thank uh, you. And I hope, <laughs> uh, I hope we, can, we can work soon on something in spanish yes. see if we can uh, tell the people down in latin america <clears throat> sneak peek spanish <laughs> translation <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah and in the u.s too obviously there's a lot of builders that speak spanish i i know that for a fact so uh yeah thank you very much and thank you everyone